Okay, so thanks for the introduction. Um, this was actually joint work with Tibor Jager, Daniel Slamanik, and Christoph Strix, who are also in the audience today. So if you're interested or want to discuss something, just approach us. And uh, let me directly start with some kind of motivation why we uh, worked on this topic. So essentially, if you want to uh, send some kind of encrypted payload data between some client and some server, you usually have to uh, establish a key first, and therefore you have to send back and forth different uh, messages in order to eventually have some kind of key which can then be used to encrypt payload data. In case uh, you're using, for instance, TCP, you even have to send back and forth more uh, messages before eventually being able to send encrypted data. And uh, what we looked at was basically how can we reduce uh, the, the messages which need to be sent back and forth here. So uh, one obvious change would be to switch from TCP to UDP in order to uh, skip one such round trip. But uh, the probably more interesting question would be how can we actually also get rid of uh, this key establishment and directly uh, send cryptographically protected payload data in the first message to the server. So this is basically the question we addressed. Um, first off, there is of course a quite trivial protocol which allows us to actually uh, do uh, zero round trip time uh, encrypt or to send an, an encrypted payload in zero round trip time. So we basically just use an asymmetric uh, encryption scheme at the server, and the client simply encrypts some key under the public key of the server and uh, encrypts the payload which needs to be sent under this symmetric key, and then sends it all to the server, and the server can again then unwrap the symmetric encryption key and uh, therefore read that data in the end. However, if you use such a simple protocol, we basically have some major deficiencies. First of all, uh, obviously there's no forward security or secrecy, so essentially if a key leaks, I leak all the data which I've previously sent to the server, and uh, typically we want to achieve forward secrecy, so which basically means that if uh, we, we divide our, our time in many periods, and if a key at a certain period leaks, then we basically only leak the data from this point on, and everything which uh, was encrypted before, so with respect to previous periods, uh, is pretty much useless or it does not leak any information about the plain text being encrypted there. And of course, such a protocol is also uh, vulnerable to replay attacks, so one can basically simply capture this message here and send it again to the server, and probably the server will reply if I use such a protocol. So uh, if we look at existing approaches, which actually uh, give us more features than this trivial protocol, we could, for instance, look at zero round trip time in TLS 1.3 or Quick. And actually, they already have quite some nice features to, to reduce the round trips which are required to establish a key. And essentially, both protocols could uh, have in common uh, so uh, that we have a session establishment. So in the first session, we need one round trip. And upon resuming those sessions, we uh, actually can do a zero round trip time communication. So those protocols uh, handle replays quite nice. And uh, the only question which remains is, do we also achieve full forward secrecy, which basically means are all messages which are sent protected in a sense uh, that uh, forward secrecy holds. And uh, the answer here is that most of the messages are actually uh, forward secret, but uh, the first or the payload data in the uh, first message, message up on session resumption uh, actually only has some limited forward secrecy. And essentially what we want to achieve is that we have forward secrecy for all messages, at the same time re replay protection and zero round trip time. So 
for a long time it was not even clear if uh, such a thing even exists, but uh, there was a really nice work last year at Eurocrypt by Günther Heil, Jager and Lauer, and they basically showed that you can indeed achieve those properties simultaneously by relying on a primitive which is called punk dribble encryption, uh, which is due to Green and Mears. Um, basically, bunk trouble encryption is pretty much like a conventional public key encryption scheme. So you have a key generation algorithm, an encryption algorithm, and a decryption algorithm. And uh, additionally, the only difference is that you have an algorithm which is called puncture. And such an algorithm basically takes some secret key and some ciphertext and outputs an updated secret key uh, which is indicated with a prime here. And the properties are basically that this updated secret key is no longer useful to decrypt the ciphertext on which it was punctured, but it's still useful to decrypt other ciphertexts, basically. And we can repeatedly apply this puncturing algorithm on keys and therefore uh, puncture it on multiple different ciphertexts. So how does this help with zero round-trip time key exchange? Basically, it's actually quite straightforward. Uh, you encrypt a message under the public key of the server, and the server can then obviously decrypt it using the secret key. And once the decryption was performed, the server punctures the key on the ciphertext. So later on, this key will no longer be useful to decrypt the ciphertext, and then it deletes the old key. So if we have uh, a Puncturable encryption scheme, which uh, somehow provides nice properties in this context, we are done and we have basically our efficiency round trip time key exchange protocol. Um, so, what are the downsides of the existing approach? Basically, uh, they are quite expensive when it comes to puncturing and or decryption. So, uh, at this Eurocrypt paper, there was a, a generic approach how to use puncturable encryption for zero round trip time key exchange. And when plugging in the existing schemes of uh, puncturable encryption schemes, you either get uh, quite inefficient decryption or quite inefficient puncturing. And both have to be done online, which is why. Uh, it's currently only a feasibility result, and uh, we basically ask, how can we improve this? And uh, on our way to basically achieve this, we looked for some ways uh, how to offload those expensive operations to somewhat less critical phases. And uh, in this context, we made some observations. So for instance, we can say that uh, usually the secret keys are held by relatively powerful servers, and therefore it's not that of an issue if we have somewhat larger secret keys. And if it helps us to somehow reduce the computation times upon decryption or puncturing, then uh, it's perfectly acceptable. Um, furthermore, we also made another uh, observation, which is quite unusual to the uh, concept of public key encryption. Namely, if you encrypt something, you typically expect that you can also decrypt it later on, because otherwise it would be a bit pointless, of course. But however, in this application, we can say that we are uh, fine with some kind of decryption error, which is uh, not negligibly small, but some very small number which is non-negligible, but still sufficient for our purposes. So for instance, if we assume that uh, we want to establish a key and one session in 1,000 sessions fails, for instance, uh, it will probably be fine. So we can if we are, can arbitrarily adjust this, this will actually be a nice trade-off. Because, for instance, in the zero RTT key exchange, we can always fall back to a one RTT key exchange in case of such a failure, and then we have to do this once in a thousand times, and for the rest, uh, we have zero RTT key exchange. Okay, so uh, having these observations in mind, we basically came up with a novel primitive, uh, which we term Bloom filter encryption, and Bloom filter encryption can essentially be seen as a puncturable encryption scheme, which has uh, those properties which I just uh, mentioned before, which we can accept, and therefore gives us the advantage that we have blazing fast encryption, uh, sorry, decryption and puncturing. 
And I'm sure most of you will probably know what Bloom filters are. For uh, those who don't, uh, let me just quickly recap how Bloom filters work. So what we basically have is uh, we have some kind of initial Bloom filter state T. And uh, this is basically simply an array of length m. And initially, this is set to all zeros. And we use k hash functions, which, which essentially map from the set which we want to insert into the Bloom filter, or for, from the domain of the set which we want to insert in the Bloom filter, uh, to one index from 1 to m. So essentially, we can obtain, using such a hash function, an index for a particular uh, value which we want to insert in such a Bloom filter. And for our example, we let k uh, be equal to 3. So just to give a simple example. And what we do if we insert some values here, x, y, z, for example, we basically simply use our three hash functions in this context, compute the hashes, obtain the indexes, and uh, set the respective indexes which are addressed by uh, these three hash functions to 1. Uh, we basically do the same for all the values which we want to insert. Uh, if we want to check whether a certain value is in the Bloom filter, we simply uh, recompute all the hash functions and check whether all positions are 1. So essentially, since we never set a position back to 0 again, we have no false negatives. However, uh, we could ask uh, what happens if some element is not in the Bloom filter. So if we are lucky, we actually get uh, some uh, indexes where at least one of the indexes is zero, and therefore we learn that, th that this element is not in the Bloom filter. But if we are unlucky, we can uh, actually get some kind of indexes which actually would indicate that the element is in the Bloom filter, but uh, actually this is not the case. So essentially we have the possibility of false positives. And by adjusting the parameters of the Bloom filter, namely the number of the hash functions and the size of the Bloom filter, and the number of elements we want to insert, we can basically uh, adjust this probability to, to some value which we are willing to accept. So how does Bloom filter encryption work then? So basically up on setup, we set up such a Bloom filter, and to each bit of this Bloom filter, we associate a key pair. So essentially, we have a secret key and a public key per bit in the Bloom filter. And uh, all those keys then combined yield a secret key and a public key for the Bloom filter encryption. So uh, this is just a, a very abstract overview. This is not our, our actual construction, but this should basically give you the, the, the basic idea of this Bloom filter encryption stuff. And if we now want to encrypt some kind of message M, we basically associate some tag tau to uh, the ciphertext, we, which we then obtain in the end. Again, compute the indexes which are uh, hit by uh, this tag, and basically then use some kind of fancy encryption scheme, which allows us to do something like uh, we want to encrypt the message with respect to, in this example here, key number 6, key number 11, and key number M minus 3, and we encrypt this message and the ciphertext should then be decipherable either by using the secret key corresponding to key 6, key 11, or key M minus 3 in this context. Uh, to puncture uh, uh, a key on a certain ciphertext, we again use this tag which is associated to this ciphertext, so tau prime in this case, uh, obtain the indexes, and then we essentially simply delete the uh, keys which are associated with uh, the positions indexed by this tag. And uh, very informally, you could basically say that if we delete all those keys, then uh, the secret key is no longer useful to decrypt the ciphertext which was encrypted with respect to uh, this tag tau. And we can already observe here that if we only have to do those deletions, so this is an, an operation, for instance, which is required in any other scheme anyways, and uh, we do not need to do more. So we only need to delete portions of the secret key, and then we are done with our puncturing. So in the end, we update, of course, the Bloom filter state that, so that we know that this key is no longer available. To decrypt, it's also quite simple. We again use the tag 
which is associated to the ciphertext, determine the indexes, and look for the lowest index where we still have a key, and essentially just perform the decryption using this uh, encryption scheme. Okay, so just to give you a basic idea of how we could adjust this, for instance, so uh, we have uh, we have some concrete numbers for one example here. So we set the maximum number of elements in the Bloom filter to be 2 to the 20. So just to give you an idea, this would allow approximately 2 to the 12 puncturings per day for a full year. So this is uh, quite a reasonable sum, uh, setting for smaller servers, probably. And uh, the false positive probability in this setting is set to 10 to the minus 3 as uh, also used in the example before. And the sizes we get are uh, Bloom filter size of 2 megabytes, and the number of hash functions uh, would be then, or the ideal number of hash functions which we get from this setting would be 10. So uh, also this is quite important to note that the number of hash functions, which essentially is quite important for the ciphertext size, is quite low in such a setting, and we actually also obtain quite compact ciphertexts using this example. So in the, 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 the very abstract idea I gave you, we've seen that we essentially have keys, or we have keys which are linear in the size of the Bloom filter, and obviously we asked if we can do better, and uh, in doing so, we basically uh, looked at different schemes, and we ended up using uh, ideas which are based on the Bordner Franklin identity-based encryption scheme, which essentially helps us to uh, compress the key to a constant size public key. And then instead of associating key pairs to each bit in the Bloom filter, we simply use this public identity-based encryption key and associate identities uh, to each Bloom filter position so that each uh, identity-based encryption key is essentially useful to decrypt uh, to decrypt the ciphertext, which was encrypted with respect to such a position. Uh, the ciphertext is then essentially linear in the number of uh, hash functions. So in our example, for instance, uh, this would actually be in the order of tens. And uh, we additionally use shared randomness and uh, a hashed variant in order to further compress this uh, thing so that we uh, in the end end up with about 3,000 bits for our setting. So those numbers already uh, correspond to the uh, recent uh, adjustments which are required due to progress in solving discrete logarithms in prime extension fields. Um, as I said before, we are willing to accept somewhat larger secret keys, and in our setting here with the parameters from before, this would be about 700 megabytes of keys. Uh, we additionally introduced some uh, other technicalities which we, we require, I'm not going into detail here, we can achieve CCA security, so the details will be in our upcoming Eurocrypt paper. And we also presented some alternative constructions which allows us uh, to achieve constant size ciphertext using attribute-based encryption. We extended all this stuff uh, to achieve uh, multiple time periods, so in a sense we can then to do 2 to the 20 puncturings per time period, and if we have used all our puncturings, we switch the time period to the next period, and again, have 2 to the 20 puncturings. And for this, we use a similar approach as done in previous work. Currently, there's also work in progress on other instantiations, so uh, Kai Gellert and Tivo Yaga are currently working on alternative instantiations in order to optimize some uh, further parameters of such Bloom filter encryption schemes. And uh, this already brings me to the conclusion of my talk. So basically the take-home message would be that uh, the existing approaches are basically conceptually very nice because they essentially give us the uh, first time the, the possibility to achieve all the nice properties we want. But uh, current instantiations are not that practical. And so what we basically uh, achieved with our work is that, uh, so in a sense you could say we do not uh, let all those operations disappear, but somehow we found a possibility to offload all uh, the expensive operations to less critical phases, namely the key generation or the switch of the time intervals. And uh, this allows us to obtain very efficient decryption. 
and uh, which basically requires uh, just uh, very roughly uh, El Gamal in the target group of the pairing. And uh, upon puncturing, we only need to do deletions and evaluate the hash functions for the Bloom filter. So those are also very cheap operations. And uh, we expect decryption at puncturing times in the order of milliseconds. So this should really be practically usable. And of course, we also expect that Bloom filter encryption might find uh, other applications. Uh, in addition to zero round trip time key exchange. So what are the next steps we are planning? Basically, we're planning to actually evaluate this in practice and also try to deploy this in a somewhat larger setting. And we would be really interesting, interested in also finding out about how this scales. So if you want to do more puncturing and so on. So we are currently also looking for partners who would be interested in implementing such a thing at uh, maybe at larger scale. So if you're interested, just contact us. And now I'm happy to take questions and thanks. Uh, so I want to ask uh, how did you do deletions in Bloom filter? As I know, if you want to do deletion, you have to use in a counting Bloom filter, right? Uh, sorry? Uh, so how did you do deletions in a Bloom filter? Uh, yeah, we actually do not do deletions. We actually insert the, the tags which, which correspond to the punctured positions, yes. and we just delete the associated keys. So we do not delete from the bloom, fit, bloom filter, but we actually insert in the Bloom filter. But uh, the positions in the Bloom filter, uh, which correspond to the inserted elements, indicate uh, which keys we have to delete, basically. OK, thanks. Hi, thank you. Um, hey. <clears throat> my question is, uh, practically speaking, in something like TLS 1.3, uh, would this be a replacement for what essentially is a session ticket encryption key mechanism? Uh, and in, in such a case, every place that the session ticket encryption key is, is replicated would have to also share the same deletion state? Um, so to the first part, uh, essentially, it could be seen of a, uh, as kind of a replacement of such a, uh, such a key, but... I think we achieve something stronger because we achieve forward secrecy with respect to every message. And if you have such a session key, then uh, the first messages are only protected as long as this key does not leak, if I understand this correctly. And regarding the replication, I guess you would have to replicate the whole state, yes. Okay, let's talk after. Yeah. Hi, thank you very much Hi. for this really nice work and presentation. Um, does your threat model extend to consider an attacker who is a malicious client who chooses encryption tags to exhaust your Bloom filter? Um, currently, we do not, but uh, so informally, we could, for instance, use techniques which, which are also used in other, other contexts where we simply would not do the puncturing, puncturing, uh, puncturing operation before for instance, the client sends a second message uh, using the, 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 the key, which was, for instance, established in the first round trip, maybe. But we did not formally uh, think about this so far. But informally, this would probably be a, a pot, uh, potential direction to look at. OK, thank you. Hello. Uh, so currently in TLS, the current thinking is that we're going to use a timestamp to limit the, the amount of replays and we're going to use pair server strike registers. And then the huge issue is, well, what happens if you have servers on the other side of the globe which are also getting replays? And it's not immediately clear to me how this work would compare to that in terms of reducing the number of replays. Because it seems like you get the same protection for a single server and with multiple servers around the world, well, you can't beat the speed of light. Yes, so this, this would be definitely an interesting direction to, to have a look at, but uh, yeah, we currently didn't have it in our scope. Last question. Hi. So what techniques did you use to do the time interval based approach? Because there's a subtle distinction between those two works and that's actually why the second one is way less efficient than the first. Uh, yes, so um, what we used for the time based approach is basically a hierarchically identity based encryption scheme and it more or less uh, uses uh, the, the usual techniques which are uh, 
you always used in, in the context of forward security. Mm -hmm. uh, and essentially, it's very similar to what is done in previous work, but uh, with a slight difference regarding all this, this key generation stuff and so on, uh, which we have to do in the context of the Bloom filters. Thank you. Okay, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you. Thank you.